Okay, uh, looks like we can get started. Um, hi, if you haven't been to one of my lectures yet, my name is Ethan Lee and I'm a rising senior at Bellevue High School. Uh, this is the fifth lecture out of our six week lecture series. Uh, today we'll be going over um, some topics including scalping, day stock slash swing trading um, and the whole idea of making money while you're trading and investing. All right, so just a review um, for trading versus investing. Uh, if you were here for um, some of our earlier lectures, we did cover trading and investing a whole bunch um, or differentiating between the two. Um, so just the pure facts, uh, trading is for short term um, and you, it usually involves higher risk. Um, so we consider this a speculative strategy. Um, this involves constant monitoring of positions. Um, it's very emotion driven and, driven and is calculated um, it's using calculated target and risk. Um, that's in an ideal case. Um, so if you have a very good trading system, you will be able to identify how much your target price or where your target price is versus how much equity you are risking for each trade that you make. For, uh, for some people, including me, I like to place a 10% equity risk for each of my trades, meaning that I'm setting my stop loss so that the maximum amount that I can lose for each trade is 10% of my total account value. So that may sound a little bit high uh, consider, considering that you are comparing it to your entire account value. But when you're trying to make a good amount from each trade, you wanna make sure that you're not setting your stop loss too low um, or too high from the current price um, or below the current price because you want to make sure that you're not gonna be um, losing money slowly and not making any capital gains because prices can fluctuate up and down and you might actually net positive when it might look like you're in the downtrend. Uh, so next, investing involves long-term um, long trading, which is not really trading, um, but it involves a low risk, which is based on fundamental analysis. So investing really just involves um, setting alerts when prices reaches certain points. Uh, so you don't have to monitor it constantly like a trader would. It's very fact and idea driven, and it is really based on your belief in the success of a company or a breakthrough. So some people consider day trading a loser's game. Uh, and I, I believe that comes from a very good reason because almost always investing in long-term positions will yield higher um, yields on investment. So if you were a day trader, you would be looking to maybe make three to 5% each day. So, you know, that sounds good. I mean, aggregated over time, that's very good. That's very good return on investment. But you have to remember that you're not gonna make money every day. So you might actually feel um, some sort of satisfaction uh, the sort of adrenaline rush that a lot of day traders really like, um, which is the reason that they actually put a lot of money and time into uh, trading. But what they will find though, is that even though they are making those short little gains each um, during those profitable trades, they're gonna have a lot, um, some uh, oftentimes more trades where they're actually losing money. Uh, sometimes that money can be more or less. Uh, it really depends based on where they put their stop loss orders and um, what, what type of emotional trader they are or what type of emotions they have when they're trading. All right, so now we're just gonna go a little bit over fundamental analysis for tra uh, investing. So previously we went over technical analysis for trading. That's kind of uh, what we focused on in the past three lectures uh, where we were trying to figure out, you know, what's the best way that I can actually set my price goals for a stock? Where should I set my stop loss? So we went over all of those orders. Today, we're not really gonna go over those orders again because when you're investing, you're really looking for a long-term outlook. It doesn't really matter between 30 cents on a share, um, like that type of pre price deviation. So in this case, we're just gonna be looking at, you know, the fundamental, where, where are we gonna find the fundamental ideas for what whether a stock is good, a good purchase or not? Right. So the majority of people hire a financial advisor to do the investing for themselves, either because they're too lazy to do it or they just simply don't know how. Um, so like mentioned in an earlier lecture, we use line charts rather than candlestick charts. So if you remember from our previous technical analysis lectures, you'll remember that we use a lot of candlestick charts. So the candlestick charts from that, we could actually tell different patterns. In this case, we're not gonna need candlestick charts because we don't really care about price deviations within very short intervals. We care about long-term price change, long-term price growth. So in this case, we use line charts. And if you remember from our first, very first lecture, line charts involve the closing price uh, during a time interval. 
So let's say I have a 365 day or one year chart and each single plotted point, it, uh, what is that, represents one day. So instead of representing the small price changes within each day, the price plot you're gonna see on each different point is only gonna be the closing price of that day. So when we're doing this type of analysis, we do not need to use technical analysis. So the technical analysis uh, involved a lot of candlestick, what is that, candlestick pattern recognition, the moving averages, we're not gonna need that for fundamental analysis. So fundamental analysis is based, based on the principle that um, related economic and financial factors will impact the price. So when we are trying to analyze whether a stock is a good purchase or not, or whether you want to actually buy into a position for long-term growth, you wanna make sure that you are able to interpret the balance sheet, the strategic initiatives of the company, consumer behavior and review, and microeconomic indicators. So a lot of this is a very long-term study. A lot of people, they choose economics um, as their major in college. A lot of people, however, you know, if the, if the college offers a undergraduate business program, they might actually have a concentration in finance with a business administration degree. So um, I've actually been thinking about this a lot, but economics, in my opinion, is very related with finance. Some people might consider it a tangent since in economics, it's a very academic approach to finance, um, not really just finance, but the financial markets, right? Because we're always, in economics, we're, connect, we're connecting sort of the financial markets, the financial sector with sort of business. Um, so a lot of people, they confuse business and finance with each other. Finance is really where the money is moving around. What, like everything involved with money, um, business more involved into like soft skills, you know, like uh, I'm, I'm talking about learning about business, right? So finance is a very academic or business and finance can have either an academic approach, which we're kind of leaning towards economics, or it can have a very practical approach in which we're learning about trading and investing. Okay, so fundamental analysis, it really involves um, a lot of different numbers. You're not really gonna be using charts um, as often as you would as a trader. So this is where uh, PE ratios, dividend yields, and line charts come in handy. Uh, if you could see this little, sorry, I need to move this. You can see this little picture. This is an Apple Inc. or a Apple chart uh, in the past day, right? So you're gonna see that type of line chart, except that's not really a line chart. You, you, you gotta make sure you're not confused. Uh, the line chart, you were usually gonna look over the interval of a month or more if we're trying to get in a position on investing, not trading. All right, so fundamental analysis has a very multifaceted approach, okay? So often one, idea in fundamental analysis that you gain, let's say from looking at a balance sheet, is not gonna lead to the other. So that's kind of the whole hard part of fundamental analysis. For technical analysis, uh, you could be like me, right? You could just take a few online courses. I took one on Udemy, three on like Coursera or something. I also spoke with my dad a lot. Um, you just figure out how do you use specific indicators um, using a candlestick graph. So it's a very mathematical, statistical approach. However, when you're looking at fundamental analysis, a lot of this is not quantitative and uh, quantitative information, but it will be very qualitative uh, information. There's no really aggregate measure of how good a board of directors is, like how good the management of a company is. You will have to do some research on who these people are, uh, where their job experience was at before, what their long-term growth goals are for the company. So yeah, you're, there's no really numerical measure of <laughs> the board of directors goal. So in this case, you're gonna to have to do a lot more thinking uh, rather than just using the like moving averages, average true range, none of that technical analysis stuff. You're gonna be having to do a lot of research online, likely not, a much, likely not much on the trading platform. Yeah, so in some ways, fundamental anal analysis can be more difficult than technical analysis. So yeah, technical analysis, as I said, we're using pre-programmed indicators like moving averages, average true range, as I mentioned. Those are just based off of um, computer tracked sort of values moving along on a chart. Yeah, so this is kind of where speaking about specific companies might come in handy. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you guys remember Alex, who's in a few different lectures. Uh, he just interjected about Tesla at a few times. So yeah, talking about an individual company actually might be very handy. So you'll kind of see uh, if you talk to a lot of people, you kind of have a good idea of the whole sort of you know, people who are active in trading, their whole sentiment behind one stock. 
if everyone's optimistic about it, then, oh, I'm likely going to see some bullish movements in the future. Uh, if everyone's like, this company has no future, it might not be a good idea to go in on a position on that. Yeah, so small price jumps are not significant in investing. That's kind of what, uh, the co in contrast to what I said about trading, where you shouldn't listen to the news. The news is going to be very outdated for any given moment. That news probably took a lot of time to be published, right? How long did it take for the reporter to get to, or from the broadcasting center, center to the reporter who was actually writing up a report um, and posting it online? There was probably a lot of time involved in there, but by then the big banks will have already caused price movements. Yeah, so in this case, this doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter unless it's like weeks old, like information doesn't, doesn't really matter if it's like five minutes old, but um, the breakthroughs will be very, very valuable um, or recognizing breakthroughs will be very, very valuable. And that just comes with experience in watching your news. So I recommend all of you to start watching CNBC broadcasting. So CNBC, it's kind of like the hub of all financial information, financial news. Um, if you watch CNBC over and over again, just listening to people talk about these terms will actually become very, very helpful. So you'll, you'll, you might hear a lot about, you know, like different types of analysis indicators that analysts reports come up with. You might actually recognize a few of those, but other than that, there's a lot of sort of jargon involved with finance, which is kind of why a lot of people are unattracted to the whole area. Um, but if you just continue to listen to those broadcasts, it'll definitely be helpful. All right. So what is the whole idea of fundamental analysis, right? So I already said that it involves the use of balance sheets, the, like the board of directors, the management, like we're kind of doing that qualitative analysis. So overall, they decide if a currently traded stock is under or overvalued. So if there's a deviation from a determined fair market price. So this fair market price, that's what an analyst determines, right? So based on the balance sheet, their future growth outlook, their strategic initiatives, where should this company be valued? So using all this information, they combine it all together, right? So this takes a lot of skill, obviously. There's people who have jobs specifically for this. Uh, for example, as an investment banker, if you're in like a, if you're in a mergers and acquisitions position, you'd be focused on seeing how much is this company worth? How much should be worth it for, um, or value it for this company um, to become a parent company to buy that company? Right, so you don't want to underprice it or overprice it, otherwise you'll have a very bad reputation. So this is not something that you guys should worry about. Uh, you should actually subscribe to a few analyst reports. So these report systems, they actually give, I think, weekly reports on which companies are over or undervalued. Right, so this is basically just deviations from a determined fair market price. So an example of um, implementing fundamental analysis. So let's say, that there's word of an oil or grass gas crisis. So in this case, uh, US automakers might actually, obviously expect lower demand for gasoline heavy vehicles um, because you know fuel prices will spike up. And because of that, there might be a little bit lower incentive for someone to buy a gasoline car versus maybe back in the seventies, like biking or taking the subway or any, any sort of public transportation. So, so yeah, uh, I mentioned the seventies because in the 1970s, there were two different oil crises because of a con uh, conflicts in the Middle East. In 1973, 1977, a lot of US automakers, they actually cut down on engine displacement. So I'm actually finding their cars, if you didn't know that. So if you kind of track the American car manufacturers, during that time, a lot of cars actually switched from V8 to V6, meaning that a lot of companies, and this is, this is kind of a side tangent, but a lot of companies kind of saw that, oh, people will want to prioritize efficiency, right? So because of this, the automakers kind of changed their, what is that? They changed their product outlook. They want, they changed their strategy. And if you kind of look at stock prices, I didn't include in this slide, but if you look at, or in this lecture, if you look at stock prices of different American companies during that time, you'll actually see that some stocks suffered more than others during that, those oil crises. Yeah. So fundamental analysis oh, analysts would have predicted uh, automaker stocks to plunge. So back then, obviously, this was not during the information age. Um, this is kind of before the whole complexity of the internet, before that came along. So at that time, you know, it took a little bit of time to actually place a trade. You would have to call your stockbroker. Um, I don't even know if there's that many stockbrokers these days anymore, but you call your stockbroker, you place the order through them, and the order is like probably not filled until minutes, maybe an hours later, if you don't have a high quality stockbroker. 
So during that time, the price would obviously change a lot. But yeah, so the next example is the CEO of a company changing. In this case, the management might be more, more or less effective. Uh, let's say that it's more effective. Um, this person might implement possible new effective strategic initiatives, right? So they actually might uh, produce new plans for the company. In this case, the share price might be anticipated to rise, right? So it, there's kind of that whole arbitrary thing, like how, how do you know whether that's gonna be good for the company? How do you know it's gonna be bad? Well, obviously there's risk involved. There's, there's no, what is that, arbitrage, meaning that there's no guarantee of profits. In that case, you're gonna have to be a very smart fundamental analyst and think to yourself, did this person, the CEO, did he move from another company, improve it and move over? Or did he, you know, make it complete detriment, like a detrimental, um, what is that, condition, and then just move because he got fired or something, right? So, you know, you have to do a lot of thinking about that. Usually it's not that obvious whether a CEO is good or not. Um, so, yeah, if you kind of look at that upside down pyramid at the bottom left, there are a few different steps in identifying fundamentally strong stocks. So where the fair market price is actually high. In that case, you'll have to do an, al an analysis of the company or the economy, sorry analysis of the sector, financial anal analysis, and the valuation of the company itself, right? So you're not gonna note like how strong a stock is simply by focusing on that stock. You're gonna have to look at the industry. You're gonna see how the industry reacts to a change in the overall stock market. So for example, if you, the automaker stocks, usually they're actually quite correlated to the aggregate stock market movement. But one actually one sector that is very, very reflective of uh, changes in the stock market because they play such a huge role in it are technology companies. When technology companies go down, usually the entire stock market follows. Yeah, so just recognizing these sort of patterns, that's going to be very necessary for you to become a good fundamental analysis uh, analyst. Sorry, I keep mispronouncing it, but uh, a fundamental analyst. So you're going to have to be a very good um, reader of what's happening in that sector or the whole economy itself so basically if you have some sort of outside knowledge or if you have some like let's say for example me like i'm pretty into cars if i know a little bit about cars that actually might be very good for me because i kind of have an outlook of oh this car is not going to do well like obviously no one likes this one so if you kind of have that sort of ability to tell something before it occurs i don't know if that sounds kind of weird or voodoo but like if you kind of have an idea of how a product is going to do, a product or a service is going to do before it actually happens or before it's implemented, then you're actually, you're actually going to have an upper hand because not all fundamental analysts or big wall street banks have people like exactly like you, right? They're, they're professionals, they're finance professionals. So you might be able to, uh, what is that? Beat the street. Um, in, in that case where you actually have not really insider information, but, sort of outside knowledge that you can bring into your trade or um, to your investment that will actually increase your chances of making money over the people, the financial professionals who work at big banks. <laughs> All right, so let's talk a little bit about the modern time effects on fundamental analysis. So you guys all know Jeff Bezos, right? Um, you might not have known that he owns the Washington Post. So if you kind of think about the media, right? The media, you, you kind of have this idea, you, you might already have this kind of idea that there's like democratic bias or, uh, and then there's like Republican bias ones, right? So, you know, that, that actually might be very relevant in the sort of field of finance. So Jeff Bezos owns the Washington Post. Um, so recently there was some sort of, or this might've been like last month, yeah, last month, where Amazon was kind of under fire for some of the privacy scandals or some of the privacy issues that they have with the company. So just look at the way that they word the headline. Um, if you can't see it, it's in the top, bottom right. So Amazon's Jeff Bezos faces off against a fearsome adversary. So just the way that they word that, they're kind of putting Jeff Bezos as the underdog. If you guys don't know this story, however, it's really behind the story of Amazon not having very strong privacy policies and putting Jeff Bezos in like this sort of connotation, it makes him sound like he's, you know, like he's an underdog, he's fighting off like the enemy, right? So just using that sort of wordage, it actually might be able to deter um, people or potential, um, what is that, viewers of the Washington Post to stay away from Amazon, right? 
So since Jeff Bezos owns the Washington Post, there's that sort of bias that um, the journalists might have. They don't want to lose their job, you know. So yeah, this kind of just brings us to the idea of the information age. The earlier access that you have to information, the more you'll be able to profit. Um, so just some of the thoughts that I just kind of covered. Some financial institutions and very par powerful figures, such as Jeff Bezos, own media conglomerates. So a conglomerate is generally generally an unrelated combination of companies that trace ownership to one parent company, or I guess in this case, a person. Um, so a subsidiary is the small companies owned under that parent, but basically a media conglomerate, for example, like let's say it's just one company. That one company owns media outlets A, B, and C. If they control the like what's covered by the media in A, B, and C, they're actually very powerful in releasing that sort of information and kind of influencing um, what is a general population sentiment. So if they're able to affect that sentiment, that actually may, might be able to affect, affect share price. So, you know, there's kind of that indirect so correlation between the news outlets themselves and like the person who owns those news outlets um, as a subsidiary. But you will have to sort of recognize these connections in order to be able to make the best sort of investment um, decision. You're not, you're not going to be able to see a clear A, B, C, O, oh, um, what is that? This is a good investment. You're going to have to see the connections. Um, this is just an example of a connection. The connections between that company, uh, the sector that it's in, right? So it, it's not all transparent, right? So fundamental analysis is very unlike technical analysis, where, I, like, where technical analysis is really just based off of risk. How much are you risking? How likely is this indicator to be right? No, fundamental analysis is literally analyzing real life, real life scenarios that just can't be measured in numbers, right? So yeah, overall, I don't really like to do long-term invest. I mean, don't get me wrong here. Like long-term investing is obviously the better decision when you're trying to make long-term profits, but I am more of a trader because I can really base my decisions off of numerical uh, data. And this kind of gives me like some hope that my decisions are very solid not just based off of like, for example, oh, the board of directors changed. Oh, my, my, my investment is clearly a good idea, right? So you're gonna have to differentiate yourself. You're gonna have to find your own personality. You're gonna have to recognize your own personality to sort of decide whether you want to be, um, what is that, a long-term long -term trader or investor, as they say, or a trader. All right, so on that note, we're gonna talk a little bit about trading styles. So we went over trading versus investing early in the lecture and in earlier lectures. Um, so now we're gonna go a little bit into the different types of trading within trading. All right, so there's three different major types. Um, the first one being swing trading, second day trading, and third scalping. So first, if you look at the bottom left, that is a graph or example of a swing trader. So swing trading involves position holding for more than one day in order to profit from price trend changes, uh, also known as swings. So if you kind of look at that photo, I'm not sure if it's high definition um, from where you guys are watching, but each one of these price movements is a swing. Um, so from that first circle to the bottom, that's one swing. From the second to the third circle, that's another swing. So a swing trader wants to make money from each one of those swings. They're not gonna anticipate very long-term growth, they just want to make sure, or they just want to make money off of those one-time price swings, right? They're not tr trying to hold on to their stock for long-term growth. For example, if they held that uh, second circle price point to the one, two, three, four, five, six, to the seventh one or the last one, they would they would have made a lot more. But that's not the focus of a swing trader. The swing trader just wants to make shortcut profits from one swing to the another, or the bottom to the top, or the top to the bottom. Um, so the next one is a day trader. Uh, if you can kind of see in that graph, this is a uh, very, very, uh, what is that? Very short interval time period. Uh, this is all one day. Uh, it might look like it's more than one day, but this is all during one day. So we, we will cover in the next lecture a little bit is the breakout. So the breakout is kind of where the price suddenly starts acting up. Um, you're going to have to recognize uh, using technical analysis, not fundamental analysis, technical analysis. Um, the all different types of intersections happening there. And from that point, there's a huge uptrend as you can see, right? So you would buy at that point and you would buy at, or you'd sell at the close. So a day trader, they will buy or sell or, um, or vice versa within the same training day. 
So if you're a day trader, you would want all your positions closed before the market closes at 4 p.m. Eastern time. For us, that's first uh, or 1 p.m. Um, Pacific time. <clears throat> Sorry. And the day trader will not kind of, they're not going to want to hold on even if they actually lose money. Because what they will find is that once the stock is in a downtrend, oh, it's in a downtrend. Like it's going to really dip down. Um, earlier, this is kind of a tangent as well, but I was holding an ETF called UVXY. Um, and I, I actually made a mistake in that case because I, I held the stock overnight or the ETF overnight, uh, thinking that it's going to go back right up. But what I realized is that when it went into the downtrend, oh, it really went into the downtrend, right? Like when it passed the previous week's low price, that's when people started freaking out. That's when the security dropped like six or seven dollars in value, even though it was only valued at like 32. Okay, <laughs> anyways, um, the next one we have is scalping. So scalping is profiting off of very small price changes. This generally happens, um, what is that? It generally happens when people actually try to buy um, or make money off of the bid ask spread. So the bid ask spread is the difference between the buying price and the selling price at that specific point. So you might not have known this, but when you're buying a stock at a specific point, that actually might be different than the selling point. So if you were to sell that stock or buy that stock at that specific time, there's different prices. So that spread, conventionally, that's what's called scalping, where you're making very little amount of money between the buying ask price and the selling bid price. You're making money in that very small margin, but that that is very, very unprofitable. Um, very little at least. Um, so these days we kind of think of scalping as profiting off of very, um, in general, small price changes. So generally after a trade is executed, it becomes profitable. Um, you're, you're usually gonna do this when you already recognize an uptrend. You're not gonna be finding an uptrend to make a scalping trade. You're gonna recognize an uptrend already happening, just buy in somewhere along that line and sell before it even ends. So just based on your style, if you're a calm trader, you might wanna go swing with swing trading. This often involves a lot more analysis than scalping because you know, you're really just trying to see if there's an uptrend or not. So swing trading, you're gonna have to use all of the technical analysis that we went over. For scalping, more of just the candlesticks. The candlesticks are gonna be more important for you just in recognizing the uptrend. Um, day trading is kind of the intermediary or the medium in that situation. So day trading, we're gonna still have to use technical analysis, um, as you can see with all the different indicators on that one graph, but uh, you're not gonna have to worry about holding overnight, because as I said, holding overnight might be very drastic for you since we're considering that the stock might open at a much lower price than it closed the previous night, or the previous day, sorry. Okay. Yeah, and for all trading types, um, just kind of differ differentiating between the styles, the entry, exit, and strategies are different. So you'll set higher or lower deviations in target prices and stop orders. So if you remember from last lecture, when you're setting a stop order, you're kind of maximizing or minimizing the amount that you will lose from each trade. So when I mentioned that I have a 10% equity risk for each trade, I'm only gonna risk 10% of my money when, or the total account balance that I have for each trade. So how do I do that? So I, I set the stop order, uh, set a certain calculated amount below the current price, saying that if the, cr if the price cl crosses that line, it will sell all my holdings in that stock. So if I do that, I'm guaranteed to not lose more money than how much I calculated at that stop loss. It, it will not sell if it goes below that, it will only sell um, in what's called a stop limit order at that specific price. I'm not gonna lose money because, or I'm not gonna lose more than 10% of my money because I set my stop loss at that specific point. So just going back to the whole overall idea of entry and exit strategies, you're gonna be spacing your stop loss orders and your limit orders different depending on which type of trading strategy you have. Uh, if you're a scalping trader, you're probably gonna put your stop loss very, very close to the current price because you, you don't just wanna lose your money right away because uh, you, you know, you're trying to make like a few cents per share in this case. Um, but if you were a swing trader, however, you'd probably set your stop loss way below. You're probably willing to risk a little bit more since you're looking for a little bit longer term growth, uh, not to be mistaken with investing, but longer term growth, um, perhaps over a day or more than a few days. All right, so, one aspect that I was gonna include, which I actually don't have to, um, was transaction fees. So this is kind of where scalping 
kind of lost its obsoleteness. I'm not sure if that's a word, but since you can't really make that much money from scalping, what might actually happen is that the transaction fees will actually outweigh the profits that you made. So you might actually lose all your profits profits through paying your transaction fees, meaning that like when you buy and sell a stock, you have to pay your broker um, a sort of commission for that trade. That trade commission actually might take away the profits. So these days, luckily, um, there's basically no transaction fees. That's following the, I think, trend set by Robinhood. If you guys know what Robinhood is, you guys probably heard that. A lot of beginner traders use it. So that's why they had a zero transaction fee or commission, zero commission policy so that the users, though they don't have to pay a transaction fee or commission whenever they're making their trade. Um, since then, all the competitors like TD Ameritrade, E-Trade, they follow them saying, that, oh yeah, you don't have to pay um, a commission when you're doing your trade. So yeah, we don't have to worry about making small profits anymore. If you make a small profit, good for you. Um, you're, you're not going to have to, what is that, worry about transaction fees because you know nothing's going to be taking away your profits like that. All right, but that kind of brings us to uh, later, I guess, um, to capital gains. Um, but anyway, just some, a little bit more miscellaneous stuff on trading. There's this whole idea of buying on margin. So when you're buying on margin, you borrow your broker's money. Um, so some percentage of a purchase has to be your money, though. Um, so that, that's what they call the initial margin requirement. So let's say if you had a 50% initial margin requirement, $5,000 of a 10,000 purchase of securities has to be your money. So you could borrow the other $5,000, but 5,000 of that has to be your money. Um, so margin trading is a little bit complex. I wouldn't recommend it for beginner traders. Uh, as you can see up top, your buying power for the stock um, res in result of buying on margin is actually way bigger than how much money you actually have because you're borrowing that extra money. And if you're buying on margin, you actually leverage your profits, meaning that you make more than if you were to just use only your money. Yeah, so that... That's why you would buy a margin would be to leverage your profits, make more money than if you're to only use your money. Um, of course, you have to give back the money that you borrowed back to the broker, um, but you would not buy a margin or, or a reason to not buy a margin would be that you're also leveraging your losses. So not only are your profit, profits magnified, but your losses are magnified as well. Uh, if you actually lose too much, they're gonna actually do what's called a margin call. Um, in the case of a margin call, or if it's activated, they'll actually liquidate your stocks or your holdings to pay back the losses to their brokerage. So if your stocks are doing horribly and you bought on margin and you actually don't have any money to pay back the money that you borrowed, they're going to do a margin call. They're going to sell all your holdings and you still have to pay a penalty or that negative debt that you had because the stock um, decreased in value. Uh, so that's actually kind of why I don't want you guys to buy in margin yet. Um, be just because there's that amplified risk of losing money and actually losing more than your account actually has. Um, so that's actually the whole purpose of the initial margin requirement so that uh, the brokerage doesn't want you, they don't want you to do like do bad. They don't want you to lose all your money, but that is actually just an insurance saying that, yeah, only that amount of money is from us. The rest is yours. Um, so yeah, that's just buying our margin. Okay, so last lecture, um, towards the end, I mentioned the whole idea of making money. I also mentioned a little bit on capital gains tax, um, but basically all of this combines into um, including technical analysis, knowing what capital gains tax is, um, knowing long-term versus short-term short, uh, timeframe decisions. That's all sort of combined in the whole idea of making money. Uh, so let's go into that a little. All right, so as I mentioned, capital gains tax, there are two different types. Uh, there's short-term gains tax and there's long-term gains tax. So short-term short gains tax uh, applies when you hold and sell a position in less than a year. So if you bought and sold a stock within that same year or within that 365 days, that'll be considered short-term gains tax if you were to, or that would, um, what would be applied would be short-term gains tax if you made a profit. Uh, remember, these taxes are not going to be applied if you didn't actually make money. I mean, they're not going to extra penalize you. Uh, what is that? If you lose money. So short-term gains tax, um, it'll just be considered a part of your normal income. So let's say your normal income tax is 30%. If you made, let's say, $40,000 on stocks this year, you would pay um, that same amount of tax or income tax on the profits that you made. So... Um, if, you, if you guys don't know a lot about tax, I mean, not a lot of people study tax. It's kind of boring in my opinion. 
Uh, this is actually all affected by your tax bracket, which is based on how much money you make. So just to go a little bit on the list up here, if you make less than $19,050, and $19, uh, your short-term capital gains tax will be 10%, all the way up to if you made over $600,000 each year, your short-term your, your short capital gains tax rate would be 37%. So 37% of your profits will basically disappear and be going to the government. Uh, so I'm not going to express my political opinion here, um, but you know that's actually changed all throughout the years, depending on whether the um, what is that our office is Democratic or Republican. So you know, yeah, but that that's that's another conversation. But long-term capital gains tax is a little bit different. It's typically lower, or it is lower in most cases here. So if you make less than nineteen thousand dollars and fifty or nineteen thousand fifty dollars then your long-term capital gains tax rate is 0%. If you make over $600,000, then your long-term capital gains tax rate will be 20%. Um, I mean, you have to recognize that this is for married couple, couples. I mean, if you're a kid uh, like me, if you're under 18, you're actually going to have to report these under your parents. So you're, anyways, you're not going to have an account under your name. Uh, what, you, what you will have is a custodial account that's under your parents' name. So this will actually be going under their, um, if, what is that, their tax bracket, what their tax bracket is. I mean, obviously we probably, none of us here make six figures, I'm guessing. So um, yeah, you, everything here is gonna be going under your parents' account. All right, so yeah, you're, like I said, you're only taxed when you make money or when profits are realized. So when you sell the price uh, or the sell price is higher than the buy. Um, the next part is dividends. We're going to go over that in the next slide, but dividends are taxed as ordinary income for taxpayers who are in the 15% and higher brackets. This might actually sound a little bit confusing, but that's why we're going to get into dividends. All right. So what is a dividend? Um, a dividend is sort of a payout that a company issues each time that they actually might have a profit surplus, um, kind of just to like reward their investors or their shareholders. So yeah, whenever a public company does well, it may or may not actually pay out a dividend. That's all up to the board of directors. So, you know, historically speaking, companies that pay dividends actually continue to pay dividends. Uh, why is that? Well, if a company paid out dividends, like rewarded their shareholders, basically, um, all throughout like their history, if they, if they were to suddenly stop rewarding their shareholders, that actually might be an indication that they're not doing well or that, you know, in the future, they actually don't have a profit surplus, you know, that they're going to fail. So, yeah, obviously it looks bad if a company that used to pay dividends um, was suddenly unable to. Um, but if you could see at this blue chip stock, Coca-Cola, their dividend yield was 3.57%. So this yield is basically just a measure of um, how much of their total value um, of the, sh like the share price paid out as a dividend. So in this case, if the dividend yield is 3.57%, 3.57% uh, of that end quarter price. So, you know, they usually pay out dividends at the end of each quarter. Um, at that specific time, that percentage of the price at that time was paid out as a dividend. Um, so I, I can't really see it here since this is a one day graph, but let's say that uh, at the end of the quarter, the price was at $50. So I'm, I can't really do the math here in two decimal decimal places, but basically the dividend would have been 3.57% of $50 um, for that quarter. Um, so companies don't always issue dividends by quarter. Some people do it semi-annually. Uh, more rare people do it annually. But um, anyways, when people pay it or when a company pays a dividend, it's represented as a percentage of the share price at the time that they issued the dividend. Okay, so the whole idea of issuing dividends is something that's in a long-term sector or like long-term knowledge. Um, when you're going long-term, you wanna buy blue chip security. So I mentioned blue chip in the previous slides, uh, previous slide, but a blue chip security basically pays a dividend or usually pays a dividend because um, dividends are usually associated with companies that are doing very well. They're, they actually have that profit surplus. Um, also, a blue chip security has a high probability of growth throughout the future. I mean, obviously, you don't want to be buying stock uh, of a company that's, you know, falling down. 
So yeah, it has a high probability of growth throughout the future and associated with that, a low risk, right? So like, when are we gonna see Coca-Cola like, go bankrupt and disappear? Probably never, right? So, you know, that's why Coca-Cola is a blue chip security. Um, so also associated with blue chip securities is a large capitalization or worth in that company. Uh, I looked up kind of like the whole classification of it. Usually a blue, blue chip security has a value or a total um, net market capitalization of over $1 billion. So the company is worth over $1 billion. Um, you don't want to buy into a company that's too small or um, too little of a market capitalization because uh, you don't know how public their information is, um, even though it's legally required for them to do so. You don't actually know if news will actually cover that company. So you don't know whether um, you're going to actually receive good information on whether the stock price is going to increase or decrease. It's like fundamental analytical information, qualitative information. You're not going to receive that be just because the company is too small for it to be cared about by as many people. So just a few examples of blue chip securities. We have Coca-Cola and the previous slide, Disney, Intel, IBM, and Berkshire Hathaway. Yeah, so just blue chip stocks. Um, you want to buy into those if you're going long term. Um, you, I mean, you can, of course, you can use blue chip stocks when you're um, trading. Um, usually, however, we're gonna we're gonna actually mention blue chip when we're talking about long term or aspiring for long term gains. Yeah. So, you know, when we're actually doing or differentiating between long term and short term, I'm doing that because a lot of people in the future, um, you guys may do this too, or you guys should do this, um, is to hold two different accounts. Uh, I mentioned this in the very first lecture, but usually. One pe uh, people have one account for long-term investing goals and one for trading uh, if, they're not, if they are an avid trader. Um, it's like, why do that? I mean, some people do it between two different um, what's that, brokerage firms. Uh, for example, my dad has an E-Trade account, but he also has a TD Ameritrade account for trading. So he uses his E-Trade account personally for investing for long-term growth. However, he actually handed over ownership, or not legally, but he handed over ownership to me basically to control the TD Ameritrade account um, because I actually trade more than he does these days. So yeah, one account is usually held for short-term trading, trading and the other one is held for long-term investing goals. So a lot of people, um, as I mentioned in an earlier slide, um, they don't actually want to invest or trade by themselves. They want to do it through a financial consultant or advisor. Um, in that case, you're definitely not going to, well, obviously you're not going to need more than one account. Um, so yeah, just the key takeaway, um, not, not the one at the bottom of the slide, but the key takeaway is that when you're deciding about what type of trader or investor you want to be, my advice would not to be go right into it. It would probably be to talk with your parents about what your goals are. I mean, we're getting pretty close to the end of this lecture series. So, you know, you want to talk to your parents about what your goals are. Do you just want to have a good learning experience while you're trading or investing? Or do you want to actually make money right so i remember i actually had on the sign up form for this class um, a measure of how actually you know strong are you um, in financial knowledge um, how, have you guys had any trading or investing experience uh the more the majority of you guys said no um, a few of you guys did um but what i do think is that even if you do have a little bit of experience uh it's best to actually have an academic approach first to um what is that the whole finance trading and investing realm rather than having an academic approach later, right? If we actually um, like, you know, go hard on the academic approach, you know, we're gonna actually be recognizing those indicators. Oh, this is the studious approach to using this indicator. This is the right way to using moving average. Um, so, you know, we wanna have that approach or we wanna build that approach as soon as possible, just so that later when you're investing or, well, sorry, when you're trading, uh, you're used to it. You don't want to actually bring those skills later on. You're going to lose a lot of money. Um, you're going to get very stressed if you actually find out about those indicators later. Um, at, and at the end of this lecture series, I'm actually going to send you guys all a document of what I think you guys should learn for technical analysis, fundamental analysis, if you guys are interested, and also just finance in general. Um, I think you guys should learn a little bit about taxation more, a little bit about insurance. I'm just going to send one pretty long document about that. Um, of course, it's optional if you guys want to read it. I don't know if you guys read it, um, but yeah. So the cool, uh, going back to what we were talking about, about capital gains tax um, going long term, taxes should be a very big consideration. Um, for many, a pe penalty of around 30% tax is common. So, you know, you don't really want to give up 30% of your holding 
or of your profits. A lot of people, what they do is they actually uh, manage to evade this tax, not illegally, by actually putting that capital gains into another stock. So they don't hold it in as cash. If you guys hold it in as cash, um, hold the profit as cash, then not literally solid cash, but right, just like liquidity, you're gonna have to pay the tax. Um, in that case, yeah, as I said, it's gonna be treated as normal income. Um, that's exactly what you want to avoid. So if you guys want to actually maximize your profits, um, continue making money off of your money by allocating it into another stock, uh, you definitely want to learn more about actually conversions, um, converting your assets into other assets. Um, but yeah, we're actually gonna go a little bit into that in the next lecture, um, which is our last lecture. And yeah, thank you for the tuning in. Next lecture, we're gonna talk about careers in finance, starting to trade now, which is gonna include a little bit more on the taxation part of it and paper trading. All right, thanks for tuning in, guys.